Okay, everyone. Um, I think we'll make a start. Um, my name is Shane Conway. I'm a researcher in the Rural Studies Centre here at the University of Galway, and I'll be chairing today. Um, Dr. Maura Farrell uh, usually chairs, but uh, she's away at um, an event in Tallinn, Estonia this week, and ironically, it's on um, EIP Agri, um, I suppose, communication tools that we used with our work with the previous NRN, so um, it's very aligned to this. Um, Today, it's the 17th session of the Rural Voices, ran in collaboration with the Department of Rural and Community Development. Um, and today we're delighted to be um, joined by Richie Farrell and Daniel Curley from the Farming Rathcrohan EIP Agri project. And they'll be presenting the work carried out by this five-year innovative multi-actor environmental scheme, agri-environmental scheme. Um, and it has been designed and implemented to, as a locally led measure which will improve the, the livelihood of the farming community in Rathcrohan and County Roscommon, but to preserve and maintain the, the unique archaeological landscape in the area for future generations to enjoy and utilise. I suppose, you know, farming myself, I can really see the value in the archaeological features, even on our farm at home, we have a ring fort. You treat it with respect as a fairy tree, you treat it with respect. So I suppose this project always was of interest to me because these features are dotted all around the, the countryside and farmers are, are very aware of it. And, and But yet, they, I suppose a project like this really brings to the fore how they can be uh, maintained and preserved properly. So um, yeah, just really happy to be joined by Daniel and, and Richie. So without further ado, I'll, and also Louise Weir, my colleague is here as well to keep an eye on the, the chat and field questions afterwards. So um, so yeah, o over to you, Daniel and Richie, please. Thanks very much, Thank Jane, you. Louise and everyone. Um, so I suppose the, the root of attack is, um, I'm going to give about 10 minutes of an introduction to the project and a Rath Cron in a general sense, and then Richie will take over and explore uh, the specifics of the project and, and where we're at and how we might see ourselves continuing hopefully into the future as well. So I'm just going to share the screen and uh, I'll get our PowerPoint um, up and running. So hopefully that's visible to everyone. Yes. Um, so Rathcrohan, Royal Sy County is common. So we're farming amongst the monuments, past, present, present and future. Uh, so my own role is I'm the manager of the Rathcrohan Visitor Centre in Tulsk, which is effectively the tourism and interpretive arm for the Rathcrohan landscape. And then I'm also the secretary for the Farming Rath Crohan Scheme CLG, which would be the parent company in charge of the, the EIP program, which Richie is the project manager for. Um, so for those unfamiliar with Rath Crohan, Rath Crohan is an archaeological landscape which contains 240 identified archaeological sites, and 60 of them are, are, are registered as national monuments, which means that they have an extra layer of state legislation attached to them. And they're all contained within an area of about six and a half square kilometres the core of which is above the 120 metre contour line. So we're located in Midrus Common. You can see the, the yellow star on the centre of the map of Ireland. Um, and if we look at a LIDAR model, so a digital terrain um, model of basically a 3D model of what the landscape looks like, you can see quite readily certain features are starting to loom large in the landscape. Um, if we apply the, the national monuments and the, the recorded archaeological sites within, the, within the, um, the map itself, you can see these red dots. Um, are quite extensive across a very small area of land. All earthen monuments in large respects. Um, so they're not all, all the time very recognisable to the untrained eye, but uh, there's evidence here that goes back a very, very long time. Um, so collectively, survival archaeological remains present a narrative from about five and a half thousand years ago. So from the early Neolithic period up until the later medieval period. So we're talking about basically the full recorded settled history of Ireland can be told that story can be told from Rathcrohan. So it's regarded as the royal site for Connacht, so the equivalent of Tara in the West. The only problem being is that we're larger, older, and obviously better in every respect. Um, so alongside the archaeological features, there's a huge um, body of mythological and literary, um, I suppose, early medieval writings that uh, refer to Rathcrohan or Crookenee as it is in the narratives. And they refer back to the monuments, the monuments back refer to them, and it possesses one of the richest heritage landscapes on the island as a result. <clears throat> and Rathcrohan is currently on the tentative list for uh, inscription onto the UNESCO World Heritage Status um, under the serial nomination of the Royal Sites of Ireland. So we're coupled together with five other sites, the Hill of Ushnock, Dunalana in Kildare, Ushnock being in West Mead, Tara in County Mead, the Rock of Cashel, County Tipperary, Navan Fort, up in Armagh. 
and that selection of six sites are currently being progressed and pushed forward in order to try and see if we can bring them to the same status of recognition on an international stage uh, as akin with Bruno Boyne or Newgrange in County Meath and Skellig Michael off the Kerry coast. So the archaeological remains, as I've outlined, present us with a profound insight into Ireland's past, but coupling it with the medieval literature only elevates the status further. So Rathcrawan serves as the focal point for an entire collection of Ulster cycle Tawna tales, raiding stories effectively, or cattle raiding stories, and if we want to be very particular, and uh, you'll become very readily apparent that we're obsessed with cattle up here. Um, so the key tale of the the, the Ulster cycle is the Tawnbo Cullinia, or the cattle raid of Cooley, and uh, Rathcrohan is its starting point and its finishing point. Uh, Queen Maeve of Connacht is synonymous with the place, her husband Alan, Conor McNass, the King of Ulster, and the boy warrior Cú Cullen. So alongside that narrative of the Thornbow Cullinia, Rathcrohan is also described in the early sources as one of the great pre-Christian or heathen cemeteries of Ireland and the location of one of the great Ainigi or seasonal assemblies of Ireland. Now these seasonal assemblies we do have echoes or vestiges of these in the Irish landscape, even to the present day, the likes of the Puck Fair uh, in, in Kerry, the likes of the Banislow Horse Fair, the likes of Climbing Crow Patrick at Lunasa. They're all vestiges of these Ainigi that um, are from a time immemorial in effect. They basically are, are occurring all throughout our recorded history in Ireland. Um, and an example of what one of these Ainigi may have looked like is represented here with a, a conjectural uh, illustration of an early medieval Enoch at Crookan. So this cross-section of archaeology, mythology and history provide the credentials for Rathcrohan being considered under that UNESCO World Heritage Status nomination. So in terms of farming Rathcrohan, then the physical character of the, the landscape, its bedrock composition is of a carboniferous limestones. It's replete with dolines and swallow holes, uh, limestone outcrops, and small quarries and also caves. It's soil and vegetation, it's a glacial till, it's of a fine loamy drift, uh, excellent for grass production, and its average depth of soil is usually about a metre. Um, its elevation, the core of the landscape, is over the 120 metre contour line above sea level. The central monument of the landscape, Rathcraha Mound, is, stands at over 151 metres above sea level, and uh, it's quite exposed up there. There's very little tree cover um, in, in the present sense. Um, and basically, as you drop off the hill, as you go down towards Ballinagar to the west or Tulsk to the east, where we're located, you can see the very uh, great dif difference in terms of microclimate, really. And its landscape character is composed of a series of glacial ridges oriented in a northeast to southwest orientation. So effectively, nearly like a piece of corrugated iron with a series of um, glacial ridges and valleys in, in between them. And then dotted amongst all those are the monuments that we see throughout. Um, so its agricultural character. The core area is about 725 hectares, within which are those 240 sites. The core of the landscape is farmed by about 50 farmers, and the majority of those are part-time. The average farm size is about 20 hectares, and pastoralism dominates. Uh, the demographics, when we were starting into our uh, exploration of what the project might represent to us, um, you know, there was a large proportion of, them, of the farmers were above the 45-year age um, bracket, which is obviously a difficulty, obviously in rural Ireland in a general sense, but equally so out here. So in order to try and put my picture into the Rathcrohan story, Tulsk Action Group, which is the parent company of the Visitor Centre, which you can see in the image, it was established in 1996 and has been operating for those last a number of years as the, I suppose, the interpretive resource and tourism avenue through which a visitor can explore Rathcrohan. Um, it's inspired by the surveys, the archaeological geophysical surveys that were first undertaken uh, in about 1994, uh, undertaken by the Department of um, Archaeology, which is, you know, a, a sister um, department of the geography department who we're talking to today in some respects um, in 1994. And they're the ones that really brought to light many of the, the features and it's the importance of the archaeology at Rathcrohan. Um, that then led to a spark of interest amongst a segment of the local community to seek to use Rathcrohan as an economic driver for the area. And in 1999, the Tulsk Action Group obtained funding from what is now Bar Falcha to provision a museum in an area of little tourism development. So in those intervening years, Rathcrohan has developed uh, the visitor centre to become the authoritative interpretive experience and resource hub for this internationally significant landscape, albeit not being always a smooth process. Um, so the challenges in developing a heritage-based community tourism resource, a brief case study, number of challenges present themselves, not least the landscape size. So it's six and a half square kilometers in the core of the area, large collection of landowners, 
not all of which would be interested in having visitors traverse their land. And that's completely understandable. Uh, the geographical separation between the facility and the sites. So the visitor centre is located in the village in Tulsk. The core of the landscape at Crohn is three and a half kilometres up to the northwest. And uh, that does lead itself to a gap, um, both reputationally, in terms of the communities involved, and there are a number of communities really you'd recognise out here, um, but also just the mere getting out there. Uh, funding requirements. So we're a non-profit community charity. Um, some funding comes in through Pubble and the CSP programme in order to fund some of our wages, but that leads itself to being very self-sufficient and uh, revenue driven in order to try and make sure that the staff are retained on the ground and that the place remains vibrant. And then beyond that, we seek to build and maintain an academic reputation out here. We, um, we're we always hunting for tourism markets and tourism interest in an area that's only recently become part of a tourism proposal of its own, the Ireland's Hidden Heartlands. We also have those that wish to traverse the landscape unmanaged and through trespass. And that's something we always um, try and steer our, our visitors away from, but it's something that we can't monitor um, exclusively uh, by ourselves. And then we have the obstacles to farming and living at Rathcrohan itself. So there's been about 30 years of continued uh, planning rejections um, for the farmers trying to build farms out here. There's declining farm incomes in migration and immigration, all byproducts of the same process. And some of the planning permissions would be directly tied reputationally to the fact that they're living in a sensitive archaeological landscape and the limitations that that can place upon them, uh, amongst other reasons. So those challenges. So due to the density of the built heritage surviving at Rathcrohan, you can see in the image on the left hand side, those are the red dots I showed earlier on. There's the, the archaeological monuments that make up the core of the landscape. But those greyish boxes that surround them, they're what we refer to as archaeological zones of notification. So in effect, in order for you to um, wish to break ground in those locations, you actually have to, you're required to have ministerial consent in order to achieve it. So that leads to huge limitations, both farming and obviously to try and uh, build a dwelling for your family out at Rathcrohan. So coupled with that, then you've got unmanaged public access and trespass along farmland. You've got traffic routes and congestion through the area. You've littering, you've unpermitted public uh, uh, gatherings, damage to farm properties and illegal burning activities and metal detecting unprotected archeological monuments, which is illegal. Um, in the past, this had led to very poor relations between the visitor interaction and the tourism enterprise at Rathcrohan via the visitor center and the local residential and farming community. However, thanks to our own initiatives, such as the farm in Rathcrohan EIP, this is significantly eased. Um, in order to try and get a very baseline understanding as to what we're talking about in terms of changes from the farming point of view, um, we can see the, the migration away from native breeds and British based breeds, mixed grazing uh, endeavors through to more um, scientific and uh, I suppose waste driven um, interactions with stock, heavier machinery, more modern machinery. Um, and all of those things either are limiting factors and can cause a disturbance on the sensitive archeological landscape or equally so, and they are putting pressure on due to their ability to be used out there in this sensitive place as well. So they have an impact on the landscape. Um, those images can speak for themselves in terms of the slippage and erosion and um, congregation in areas uh, in areas of the year when it's not suitable to do so. Uh, they can have an impact on the monuments. And these are just four examples of most good number that we could point out. Livestock erosion, sheep shelter and bank erosion and so on. Um, we also have the unmanaged access and the loss of character. Um, these are all issues that would have identified themselves to us as we sought to try and close the gaps between the visitor interaction and those that are, are living and farming and breathing out of Rathcrohan in order to try and see if we can make it a resource for everyone. So that led to the background for the European Innovation Partnership application and the Farming Rathcrohan EIP began really as a as a, a meeting amongst very, um, I wouldn't say hostile um, potential uh, respondents, but certainly people that were slightly um, suspicious of one another. On the 8th of October 2015, we brought in farmers, we brought in archaeologists, we brought in our heritage officer into one room in order to try and start a discussion that we're trying to view Rathcrohan as an opportunity for sustainable development for all. This ultimately led to the, the application for the EIP, the locally led um, schemes, the agri schemes. Uh, initial application 2016, final approval 2018 and the funding cycle from 2019 to 23, which was at 984,000 euro, and a total of 23 Irish projects, 57 million in total, and we're the only EIP across Europe to focus on preserving built and cultural heritage. 
And um, before I hand over to Richie, I just want to point out three initiatives that have been developed and are being developed as a direct result of the value of the farming project is placing out to the participants out in the land. One of which is, is our walking trail. So we're currently in the development process of a 13 kilometre Waymart walking trail out through the Outdoor Recreation Infrastructure Measure 3. And uh, this will explore 15 monuments across the Rathcrohan landscape with nine participant farmers. And none of that would be possible unless we had our farming project in place as the first step in the right direction. And what this will in, in, in real terms provide for the farmer, uh, we'll place them up on the walk scheme. That means that they'll get a, an annual uh, payment for the inconvenience um, of having people traverse their land, but also it'll be fully insured by um, Sport Ireland. Um, so public liability will cover all participants that take part on any aspect of the trail, which means that it re removes any of that issue that might be in the minds of the farmers in the process. And as a byproduct of that, the now decommissioning of the N5, the main Dublin to Castle Bar route, um, will also see uh, the possibility of an active travel initiative, which would link Tulsk out to as a way of basically providing um, motor free traversal out and visitor action, but also local community being able to use these trackways and routeways out to the monuments and back in again. Uh, even the the you know, the the infrastructure placed out on this the trail itself will be innovative, uh, not least our our styles. You can see a diagram on the right hand side, which is a style that doesn't actually break ground, and um, that's actually been implemented in physical form at the present. And we hope to have this trail up and running by June of 2024. Um, everything being kept to schedule, so it'll be the only trail in the country that is directly interacting with archaeological monuments, um, and that is part of its theme and its genesis and effect. Uh, beyond that, this allows us also to explore other aspects of our, our built and cultural heritage. We're currently working on a, a Royal Irish Academy World Heritage Archaeological Research Grant based around the Ohm Stones of the Rathcrohan landscape. And this, again, would only be achieved due to the, the first steps in, in the collaboration, I suppose, objective that we had with the farmers. And then our future plans are all growing out of this, not least our, our place partnership um, proposals working with Fall to Ireland, but also trying to uh, evolve the farming Rathcrohan EIP into its next stage beyond 2023. And uh, as I said, the aforementioned um, active travel routes. So this is the green shoots that emerge out of, of going down this road and, and taking this effort and, and risk and, and putting a shoulder to try and making, making things a resource for all, really. And with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Richie and Richie can uh, explain a lot more about the farming project in a general sense. Okay. Thank you, Daniel, and um, thank you to the Rural Voices for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Um, my name is Richie Farrell. I've been the project manager with uh, Farmer Rakhran, and the project manager is kind of a very kind of unique role. Uh, I always use it as an example that I'm more like a conductor of an orchestra. I don't need necessarily need to know how to play all the instruments, but I certainly need to know how we can produce a fine tune at the end of it. Um, we're looking at this in the terms of the lens of preserving the past and protecting the future. And that's in between that dash there is kind of where the farming rack Crahan sits. It has sort of provided a bridge between the work that has been uh, done in the past and the project very much linked with the Rakhran Visitor Centre as a sister project and how we want to see it develop uh, into the future. Um, uh, Daniel touched on some of this, so I may skip over. There might be some com uh, comparisons with what he has done before in terms of the amount of money that was got. It. The EIPs were, are kind of the European Innovation Partnership projects. And the, the key to that really is kind of the European side of it, of course, uh, which always looking at the project, not just at the local, but looking at it nationally and looking at it internationally. And it is in that context, really, that we should be placing kind of Rat Crohan itself. And that's the way I kind of look at it. It's innovation is a big part of it. Um, the project has to be innovative and has de demonstrated that it is innovative in how it approaches this. And it's it's a project in itself. The project I always use is a, is a, a unique project. Uh, undertaking because it's designed to deliver a specific objective in within a defined period. That's the beauty of projects. And I love projects because of that, for the simple reason that um, there's no capacity, as I've said many times, to be kicking issues down the road. There's no road to kick them down. So you have to deal with the issues as they are presented within the time frame. So this kind of slide shows you just some of the other examples of the EIPs that are working around the, 
around the country. They're very specific to their area. So they're working in as far north as any shown in the Uplands Farmer Project. There's the Hen Harrier Project, Peril Mussel Projects, Dunhall Farming Blue Dot, Catchman's EIP, and Farming Rack Crahan is part of those kind of uh, projects that were funded specifically looking at kind of the farming and the innovation uh, within, within those areas. Important, I think, uh, and helpful during this discussion to think of it under three pillars is the way we look at it. You have the archaeology on one hand, you have the farming on the other side, and you have the third leg of the stool, which really is the cultural heritage side. And placed on top of that, you have the archaeological landscape itself. So the project, uh, because of its nature, is very much inter kind of partmental approach. So we have a, quite a number of stakeholders and partners in it, and it has to work there. The project is is delivered through the funding from the Department of Agriculture, Food and, and Marine. And then we, of course, we have a strong operational group and we have representatives from the National Monument Service, um, Rakran Visitor Centre, Chagast, um, Nolik Feeney, the Heritage Office of Roscommon County Council, two from the University of Galway, and we're currently developing other partnership with the La Roscommon Leader Partnership and with Fauci Ireland, as Daniel has mentioned, for the place partnership, and of course, the Department of Housing and Local Government. So it's very much a, a kind of project partnership uh, that has worked and worked extremely well. A very strong operational group, and that has to be acknowledged in terms of what they bring to the table in terms of their skills um, and their advice and their knowledge. Daniel has showed you, shown you these. This is the Rakrahan Mount. This is where the farming EIP project kind of is, is centered. So that's the central mound, the Ratnadar, which is kind of the fort of the bulls. The only got the famous cave of the cats, the Muklas, the, the fabulous rooting of the magical boars and red ignorees. Those are and Dahi Stone. That gives you some of the kind of uh, idea of the kind of main kind of features of it. But as he said, uh, there are 240 of these archaeological features. The farming rack crahan now is currently managing 75% of the core area of this rack crahan area. There are 45 farmers, as we have at the moment, in the scheme. Now, 33 of those are kind of full-time farmers and 12 are trainee farmers. Now, that's that's a, a fabulous take-up in terms of the farmer involvement and engagement in the project. And that, I think, has to be acknowledged. Daniel showed you that already. I won't go into it too much. The Royal Sites of Ireland, we do mention it because it's the prehistoric and medieval era. It was the provincial capital. It was a ceremonial site defined by the central mound, a particular political power base and the myths and legends and the UNESCO World Heritage. The reason I put those in is to keep reminding people of a kind of the, the, the way the pillars kind of link together and how the, the project works. We all know about Thorn, Bokulna and the legendary Queen Maeve. Now, the objectives of the projects. Um, originally started out with a few simple objectives, but like all projects, they evolve and change. So there are shifting objectives and strategies, which is kind of to build in resilience into the project. And I mentioned those in a few in a few moments. Primarily, really, was to continue the sustainable management of the Red Crahan farming landscape. And I think the project kind of has delivered that because it was important to have kind of a local project that was locally led from the bottom bottom up driven by the local community themselves who saw the need so also retention and key farming support elements of the, the project by that i mean it, there is a kind of a result-based scheme and an action-based scheme which kind of supports farmers and uh, kind of in delivering of the of the objectives as well and the farmers uh, we, we have to acknowledge are the custodians of the landscape and have been for generations so it's important that they are placed at the core of what we do. So we also want to maintain actions that preserve the archaeology and the unique landscape. And we've implemented pilot systems to provide us and manage public access. We provide training opportunities, which I'll mention some of those in a few moments, to all of the farmers. And um, we're also promoting increased awareness and recognition of Rack Rahan. And I'd like to think that the farming EIP project has contributed to that in some ways. And very importantly, is improving the viability of the farms and the changing farming practices. And um, a lot of the farmers here, many of them would be kind of part time. Some of them might be living off the land and coming to work here. So the project provides uh a very valuable stream of income to farms, and that must not be forgotten in terms of how it supports farm incomes. Uh, but also the project is kind of delivering 
uh, on the challenges that are facing farming into the future. And we're all, this, these are the kind of the big picture stuff we always have to keep in mind, the, the role of agriculture and the emissions that are coming from agriculture, the pressure that's on agriculture as well. Uh, to deliver on those on those changing farming practices that uh, Daniel had alluded to there, and I'll just mention again the the, the project is limited. Daniel has mentioned this in terms of the core aspect of the project and what is managed. So I moved on. So what we've done is really we've worked with the farmers to ensure that legal requirements are addressed. And the reason we put that down there is because the the pro what the project does really is that it it provides a local point of contact, which must be not underestimated in terms of what that provides to the local community, that farmers can come to us and see uh, that their farms are within these kind of zones of area of notification and the legal requirements. So they're able to get some, kind of some advice. And within that, so I have to mention that we have on the project as well, a community archeologist who works with us to ensure that kind of the legal requirements are addressed and that all our farm plans and in terms of what we can do are addressed as well. So we're kind of supporting new farming practices. As I just mentioned, no ground interference, um, greater appreciation of the role of farmers, farming plays in protecting the environment. Uh, we have to mention that because the farming tradition has existed as long as the archaeology itself, and we still view it that farming is probably the best way we, to manage the archaeology if it's correctly managed. It delivers positive outcomes and rewards for farmers. It is a reward system. Uh, the better they look after the kind of monuments, whether that be the result-based scheme or the action-based payments scheme, they are rewarded for it, and rightly so. And the big thing, of course, is changing the mindset around the presence of archaeology. It may in the past have been viewed as maybe perhaps a negative thing that you can't go near and you can't do certain things to it. It has changed that, and they look at the archaeology, we hope, and I believe we've only started, but change the mindset around that it's a positive thing now that they they look at it as something that they can can get a reward for it and are heavily invested in it. Um, livestock choices, as Daniel had mentioned, uh, strict regimes about grazing monuments, about use of machinery, about the time of farm outputs. It's predominantly cattle rearing or sheep rearing, so it's finishing cattle. That's the, what the landscape is is about. So the kind of the pressure on the agriculture to deliver those outputs has an impact on how the project works. The income support that I've mentioned, the farm viabilities, and the future sustainability of it, and of course the climate agenda, which we cannot ignore, which is which is always on the radar and which is keeps being coming involved in, in every application that we make. So that's the core area. We've mentioned those and Daniel has mentioned them. So how do we do this? Basically, we conduct about three, it used to be two, but I get out to the farms three times per year. And what we do is each farm has a farm plan based and we identify a number of interventions that are required for the farmer to undertake within the year. Now there's a result-based scheme which they get rewarded on based on kind of the abundance of the archaeology in it, about the grassland and about the water features as well and they're scored accordingly and there's a multiplier within that which issues a payment to the farmers. Then we have an action-based process as well where farmers may have to undertake very specific actions in to protect the monuments. They may have to fence off water sources. They may have to do some hedge planting, may have some dry stone wall repairs. Uh, they may put down a lot of geotextile in terms of gaps and access points, avoiding poaching. And there's about 30 specific actions that go into that whole process and they're scored accordingly. There are biodiversity actions as well, which were introduced two years ago as part of that. And I mentioned those sl slightly further on. And we look at those in terms of, as I said, the archaeological features, whether they're national monuments or not, whether they're just archaeological features. We're looking at the grassland protection. We're looking at the water, the ponds and the wetlands. And we're looking at the ancient fieldways and trackways, which are kind of sometimes not very visible. But when we have the maps and show them, we know that there are there. So what I'm doing here is I'm giving you an a kind of a snapshot of a typical farm and the, and the outline is in the yellow of the farm size. So we agree the actions with the farmers. We don't come down and say, I want you to do this. This is the way you do it. We agree it with them as to what can realistically be done. And we check with the National Monument Service that all the paperwork is in order in terms of the statutory requirement. We get the approval and consent. We conduct the inspection visit to ensure everything is done. Uh, that the result-based payments can be issued or the action-based payment can be issued. 
the photographic evidence because you have to have a strong paper trail for all departmental projects in terms of what you're doing, which will provide evidence for us going forward. And we constantly monitor the sites and the roles of the farmers I have to uh, mention in monitoring the sites, whether we're putting up scratching posts, whether we're doing the water features, whether they're making sure the fences are properly electrified. That's all happening. So they have a greater investment role in it. And we also issued biodiversity payment. And I'll mention those shortly. So the little codes on the right, the G5Bs and the E3Bs, these are all codes that internally for office purposes where we have codes in it. But that Those are the list of codes. So all of those are kind of the actions that farmers are kind of undertaking on their lands. So they can range from removing scrub, removing rushes, uh, topping of rushes, rerouting machineries, uh, fencing water sovers, removal of vegetation, all of those. And the, on the picture on the right is a scratching post, but I'll mention those a, a little later. So the success of the project really is based on the fact that the higher the quality of the work being done, the higher the payment. Uh, these are complementary actions kind of to improve the scores. And I have noticed that and like to, over the lifetime of the project, the scores would have gradually increased from about 6.88 to is currently standing about 8.87. And I'd say they'll get up to a, possibly a little higher in this final result based payment this year, which is evidence really of the impact of the project on the ground in improving kind of the landscape and the farming within the area. That's a typical scorecard uh, for the result-based payment. As you'll see, uh, there's an individual field score based on the archeology, span uh, there's a water quality score, and then there's a grassland score as well. And th that kind of detail is in the project office in terms of how their payments are kind of worked out. The biodiversity and green agenda is, is big, a huge impact and a growing impact. So this is kind of looking at the wildlife and geology in terms of what Daniel mentioned earlier. And we have 32 sample species indicators of plants uh, for the project that are kind of identified within farm areas. And we're looking at kind of the habitats and, and develop scorecards for those um, for field margins, wet areas and water sources. And we've introduced these as part of the farm plans. Uh, and the idea being of those is it is not just specifically for kind of doing individual specific actions, but taking the whole of landscape approach because the environmental, the biodiversity, the pollination is a big part. So there are buffer strips, there are hedge uh, margins uh, being put in as well. Those are kind of just this, the bio, uh, plant species indicators. This is an example of kind of the way a monument that would have kind of looked before kind of for the project got after it. On the right hand side, you'll see the recovery period, which the bespoke fencing, which we have around it and to let it recover naturally. And when it gets to that stage, then we may permit a certain uh, precision grazing to go on in it and uh, take them off and see that it's been properly managed. Uh, the project has also produced a kind of a number of farming archaeological products as well. Uh, on the right hand side of the bottom, you see the base book fencing, which is kind of recycled head bases with uh, the standard electric fencing posts. Those have been modified even further over the last month or two to the limestone base uh, with uh, kind of a new recycled plastic hole drilled in the middle that sits in it, make it easier because we had mixed results from these. But this is a good example of how uh, some stuff works well and some not so well. But those are an essential part because of not breaking the ground. And the middle one is is the uh, developed scratching posts, which are cattle scratching posts. They're a huge popular. I have more demand for these because these are being uh, easily transported. They're de designed and developed by the project office. They can be moved about on the landscape. There's a concrete and precast base on it that can be lifted and moved around. And the scratching posts are, the idea of these is to distract livestock away from certain kind of monuments. Uh, and they do, they do work. Uh, on the bottom left are the Rakrahan gates as well, which all of you many would know, the raw hired and farm gates. Um, these are a kind of a modification and a design on those. And these are being gradually introduced back into the landscape as part of a kind of a built heritage to give it a certain identity as well. A uh, little uh, curved bar, it represents the mound. And you might be able to make out two little bulls uh, climbing up on top of it. And this is a sample of kind of 
the resting frames that we use, these are recycled frames. They're about a meter and a half square. And there's a mesh that goes on top of them and they're electrified underneath. Uh, we, where kind of we have scalp damage and monument damage and we allow the mon monument to recover kind of naturally over a period of time. These are easily transportable uh, as well. And they, they they are effective, particularly for the small small erosion areas where the bigger erosions take take place, we would have done the archaeological trialing works, which I may mention. And where we have extensive damage, the best solution is to fence it off actually completely for a long period of time. And a farmer will get a payment for that as well. If you have to fence off a monument for an entire year, then that comes at a cost. Uh, the project also provides fa farmer training. So we would have done farm training on landscape repair. We've done traditional hedge lane. We do dry stone walls because we have numerous dry stone walls and we could do with another EIP just to finish the dry stone walls. We've done soil compaction and nutrients training and water quality with the National Federation of Group Water Schemes. Um, we've done precision farming as well uh, with Chagast. Uh, we do the TAMS training um, and some grassy margins pollinator uh, awareness sessions as well. And we, we also did uh, some partnership training with the Farm Connect, which was another EIP, which was looking into the farmer well-being and farmer health and safety. And we're also looking at the moment in terms of how the future of the project might look in terms of agribusiness and ecotourism. Uh, I mentioned, or they have to mention the Irish native breeds. We are uh, have a kind of working partnership with Roscommon Sheep Breeders Association as well, which is the reintroduction of the uh, native Roscommon sheep back into Roscommon. That was an example of the farmer training that was run with Chagast, which is the environmental farming insensitive landscape, very valuable in terms of soil compaction, structure, machinery and damage. And um, on some occasions we take undertake specific works at second sites that I've mentioned. So this is the kind of works we would have done at Rackmore site. And the top picture would have been the way it kind of was. It was just kind of general appearance. So we would have done some improvement works. The dry stone wall repair would have taken place. We put in a new rack crawling gate. The idea was to improve the public appearance of it. And a big part of that was, of course, the farmer contribution. And they were great days. I know the weather was very bad, but there was a great community spirit in terms of the old male and people getting together and having the chat and the crack and contribution to the day, the project itself. There and they are communal actions. So kind of we want to upgrade the information science as well as part of that. And this is a site that kind of we're looking at as developing as a probably a model farm project where we'll have a lot of the features uh, confined kind of in one area that people can look at. And um, our current developments are at the moment is the successful trialing works that we conducted at Ratnadarv and the Muklas. These are kind of two national monument areas where we undertook specific trialing, trialing works, the first of their kind in the country, uh, hugely successful. And we're hoping to be, if we get renewed, to go, go back to that project again. The way Mark Luke walked that Daniel mentioned, which is we all feel is, is a game changer in how uh, this, the access to the landscape will be managed. Uh, we're still looking at the only GAT pros conservation management plan, but I don't know how that's going at the moment. We are working with the leader partner program in order to the climate champions in Erasmus as well. And we had a big conference here back in August in terms of sustainable farming and archaeology. Um, we're working with Fort Ireland on the Roscommon Place Partnership. We're, I know Shane, you're there. Uh, we're contributing to EU best practice models, and I'll have that for you before lunch tomorrow. <laughs> and we're looking at further models, funding models, and options uh, for, for full, partial, or sweet funding. Now, this is key focus of our deliberations at the moment. Uh, the project is coming to an end with all funding to be <laughs> drawn down and mm. ceased and completed by the end of the year with a slight little leeway into 2024, which I cannot go into. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of our efforts are in preparing uh, applications at the moment for various sources to provide the funding and that application for renewal and regeneration, which is crucial. I just mentioned the archaeological trialing works. These were done uh, in collaboration with the National Monument Service and Heritage Council uh, as well, uh, this kind of down to Muckles where you had severe damage to it and there was a two-week project of work to kind of repair it with the geotextile and the soil and sod and everything. So that's an example of a project that would have been done very specifically for some monuments itself. 
um, range of activities. We had a very hugely successful Bloom Festival event. I thought it was anyway. We were up in the Bloom Festival uh, uh, for five days back in an amount of people we had going through there would have been um, quite extraordinary. 10 to 12,000 people over a, a few days it was great promotion for the bike. What we did was create kind of a miniature landscape of, of Rack Rahan with the central mound and stone walls and miniature gates and all the rest of it. Um, we had the conference, as I said, and we also did presentations to the Adopt a Monument Conference because we have a very strong relationship, which I have to mention, with, with the Heritage Council, Heritage Week events. We want stronger links with the OPW under the Royal Sites. Um, we produced a number of digital video packages, which we're hoping to get uploaded by the end of the year. We are working with links with Roscommon County Council under their climate action strategy. We're basically following the money, folks. Right. And the Rack Rahan Place Partnership initial steps and preparing the application for the department for renewal. That's a picture of the board, Leo Bloom, the miniature, um, which I loved and had a great time at. And I'll leave you with this final one, which is taken from Winston Churchill. Which he said during his finest hour speech, if we open up a quarrel between the past and the present, we shall find that we have lost the future. Now, I know he was speaking of it in a different context, but I think it's very apt from where we are with the project at the moment. There is no quarrel or there should be no quarrel about the importance of the project uh, and what uh, it is trying to achieve here. And we feel that if we don't uh, try and convince him, and shape a conversation and get it refunding, we could very well lose the future. Thank you very much.